I thought this week I'd discuss logical fallacies, argumentative fallacies. Um, these are important, important for your writing, uh, for the development of your argument or your persuasion in your writing. And of course, um, uh, when we talk about argument in this sense, we're not talking about pounding the table and getting mad and yelling and getting right in the face, but uh, persuading others to your point of view through hopefully the use of sweet reason. Um, but what you want to watch out for is you want to watch out for what's known as logical fallacies because these discredit your argument from the very beginning. If you get caught in one of these, like the little graphic says, uh, what you say, what you propose, what your argument uh, is, is um, caught with its pants down, as it were. Your argument shortcomings are exposed. And I'll explain this as we go on. And in this uh, presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the various fallacies. Um, so you can be aware of them and not commit them. Just as valid arguments can be divided into you know, the logical uh, or rational, the emotional or the ethical, so can false arguments, or to use the terminology of the day, fake arguments, um, as opposed to fake news. So fake arguments, okay, so that's what these are, fake arguments. And so um, I'm gonna divide them up into these categories and we're gonna take a look at them. It's very common for us to pose an argument as one thing causes another. As in, you're at a gas station and uh, you see somebody starting to light a cigarette. You said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> you light that cigarette, you could catch the whole gas station on fire. You catch a car on fire. You see, one thing causes another. That's a logical argument. But we can make a mistake in assuming that just because one thing happens first, it causes something else to happen that happens after it. This is uh, a fallacy of logic uh, referred to formally as post hoc ergo propter hoc. After the fact, therefore, because of the fact. And so, um, for instance, the uh, rooster crows before the sun rises. That doesn't mean the rooster's crowing causes the sun to rise. If you made that reasoning of logic, that would be fallacious, that would be fake, that would be false. You see, so uh, just because one thing happens first doesn't mean it necessarily causes the second thing. Or that black cat that jumped in front of you just before you got into the car didn't necessarily make you be late for work. Maybe you're sleeping an hour later, contributed to that, or didn't uh, 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 cause you to get the traffic ticket. Maybe going 50 in a 25 zone had something to do with that. You see, so um, just because one thing happens first doesn't mean it causes the second thing to happen. Or maybe, um, we attribute something to just a single cause. Now, in real life, sometimes there's multiple causes for something. Um, uh, so, for instance, uh, as in the example that we have here, um, what caused the accident? Well, the road was slick. I skidded out of control. Sounds reasonable. Was there anything else that contributed to the accident? Well, maybe. The 17 tequilas you had before you left the bar had a little bit to do with the accident, you see. So there's more than one cause, not just the road being slick. The slippery slope argument, uh, fake argument, is one that we hear quite often. Uh, I've often heard people refer to the slippery slope. It's a slippery slope, we can't do this. Um, anytime somebody says it's a slippery slope, know that that's false. That's a fake argument. You see, because it's based upon, if you take one step onto a slippery slope, just imagine a slippery sl slope, you know, a slide, you know, um, downward incline. Um, there's no stopping until you get to 
absolute oblivion to the absolute bottom. Okay, so uh, if you have that one cookie, you won't stop until you eat 10 pounds of cookies. Huh? Okay. If we let the kids choose what they want for dinner tonight, pretty soon they'll be deciding what doctor they want to go to. They'll be deciding, you know, they want ice cream for dinner every night. And no, I mean, you know, just if I make an exception for you, I have to make an exception for everybody. No, that's why they call it an exception. You see, so the slippery slope is also called the slippery slope. It's called the domino effect, knock over one domino and all the rest will follow. It's called the camel's nose under the tent um, fallacy. Um, in that if you let the camel get its nose under the tent, pretty soon the whole camel will be in the tent and you'll be outside. Um, it's called the snowball effect after that cartoon snowball that just rolls downhill and gathers, gathers, and gathers more and more snow. Um, but know that it's wrong. Okay. Um, there is some sort of human agency that can intervene and say, no, we're just going to have one cookie. Okay, I'm going to break my diet to the tune of one cookie. Okay. Now, for me, it doesn't work, you see, because I just have, well, I'm just going to have a taste of ice cream. Pretty soon, I have a bowl. <laughs> so, I have to watch out for the slippery slope argument, but uh, um, because for me, it's true. But most of the times, it's not true. It's a fallacy. Another fallacy is the either-or fallacy, um, sometimes, sometimes called the false dilemma or the fallacy of the excluded middle. Okay, so what this means is there's no middle ground. Okay, uh, you might think of it as my way or the highway. Well, no, there's lots of other roads that you can take. Okay, um, this is when somebody presents or you present um, a a an argument that it can only be one thing or another. So here's an example. Um, many years ago, um, I uh, took my car in for an oil change, right? Um, I had a coupon, okay? So I got a great deal on it. I'm, I'm Scottish, I, coupons, okay? Deals, bargains. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, um, so, the guy did the oil change, and then when I came back to pick up the car, they can't pay my, you know, you know, fifteen dollars or whatever it was. Um, he said, "Well, you know, you gotta do a repair on this, and it's going to cost you a thousand dollars, which is a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of money in those days. I was just beginning my career. You know, I had little kids and a family, and trying to support everybody. And and he said, uh, you know, and if you don't do it, and if you don't give me a thousand dollars." You know, you're a bad father and a danger to society because you're going to get in the car, you're going to have your kids in the back seat, you're going to be on the highway going 60 miles an hour. He didn't know how I drove, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, the car is going to blow up. Okay. So there we have a fallacy, you see, right? Either pay him $1,000 or the car is going to blow up. Well, there are lots of other alternatives in there. Okay, and, you know, one being, he's lying to me. Don't need to get that old, worn-out transmogrifier changed, right? You know, another being, well, maybe it would go out on me, you know, when you know I'm going five miles an hour, when I'm in the driveway, or I'm on the way to work by myself, and you know, so there's lots of other alternatives. You see, but he presented this either-or fallacy, the fallacy of the excluded middle. There's nothing else in the middle between paying him this exorbitant rate and the car blowing up and killing me and my family and you know you know dozens of people around me all right well being a student of logic i didn't get that repair done and guess what here i am the car didn't blow up Then there's the non sequitur. Non sequitur, uh, sequitur from Latin word for sequence, something in sequence, and non meaning not, you know, so it's not in sequence. It doesn't follow. You can think of this as the huh? Um, <laughs> uh, fallacy. Um, uh, that tickled me so much I just <laughs> started laughing my own 
corny joke, <laughs> what uh, what my kids call a dad joke. Okay, anyway, so um, this fallacy draws unsupported, unwarranted, um, illogical conclusions from scant evidence. Okay, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't follow. Hasty generalization is. Uh, jumping to conclusions. Okay, um, it's drawing your conclusion from too little evidence, um, and the uh, I couldn't find any other il illustration than you know it's hasty generalization. So here's a hasty general. Okay, you know, so yeah, it's the best I could do. Anyway, uh, but um, it's like this: uh, somebody goes to a big box store, okay, and comes out and said, um, "All clerks at the big box store are rude." Well, how do you know that? Because the clerk in there was rude to me. One clerk was rude. And so the million employees at Big Box Stores Incorporated uh, are all rude. You see, that's a hasty generalization. That's, you know, that's drawing a, 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 a universal truth from just one incident. Okay, so that's a fallacy. That's a fake argument. Okay. A red herring, and in a moment I'll explain what the term comes from. But it's, uh, uh, but it's starting to argue about something else. It's changing the subject. Okay, so um, uh, the boss is asked for a raise, and he says. Um, well, you know, that's a valid consideration, you know, but we try to give the best customer service to our customers. Customer service is very important to us. Yeah, but we're not talking about customer service, okay? Uh, if, if the company um, is found out to be planning to move to the Sahara Desert for some reason, okay, um, um, they make sand, okay, and a lot of supply of sand, or they use sand in their manufacturing, okay, so uh, they say, <clears throat> Well, I know you're concerned about uh, moving to the Sahara Desert, um, but what do you have against warm weather? It's very warm there. Are, are you an anti-warm weatherist? You know, so changing the subject, maybe accusing you of, of doing something. Um, like the little illustration says, uh, you, know, you can think of it as a Bart Simpson argument. Um, um, uh, uh, if I hadn't done it, somebody else would have. So it's not really my fault. Or, or I didn't do it. Nobody saw me, and you can't prove a thing. Okay, you know. So uh, mixing up the argument, changing the argument. So where did the term red herring come from? Well, let me just explain it. It's a uh, it might help you remember what it actually means. Many years ago, back in the day, um, most of the land uh, in Europe and uh, Britain uh, was owned by the lords, the lords and the nobles. And, um, and regular people, poor people, could not go hunting because the land was owned and the game was owned. You know, the wild game was, was owned by the lords and the nobles. And um, uh, sometimes a poor person was pressed to uh, go hunting or fishing, you know, uh, uh, fish in the river or the lake or uh, 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 sh shoot a rabbit, snare a rabbit in a trap, something like that to feed his family, right? Um, and uh, so the lords and the nobles, they had a bunch of um, henchmen, of gamekeepers, uh, who would go out after the poachers, which was illegal again. It was illegal. It was against the law. And so the uh, poacher could be punished for stealing, you know, so uh, uh, whipped, um, uh, hung, or uh, what they call transported, uh, sent off to uh, America or Australia, something like that. So anyway, so um, in order to get away, Sometimes the poacher, you know, the uh, game thief, you know, the guy that was just trying to feed his family, would cut open, you know, the rabbit or the fish, uh, let it bleed, and throw it off in the bushes in one direction, then he'd run off in the other. Okay, so now, uh, that's where you get the term, the herring, which is a fish. A herring is a fish. So the red herring is the bloody, you know, a catch uh, from the hunting that the dogs would follow because they'd follow the more interesting smell. You know, hmm, smells like lunch over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, uh, and while the poacher was running off in the other direction, hopefully with, uh, uh, with uh, 
uh, some other game that he caught, maybe, you know, a rabbit or another fish or something like that. But anyway, that's what the red herring is. It's a distraction from the main argument. And uh, when somebody uses it, they hope that you don't notice and you start arguing about, well, as my mother said, the co price of tea in China. Another logical fallacy that we sometimes encounter, and this might be more in the lines of a possible logical fallacy, is that of tradition, the fallacy of tradition. Now, there are many traditions that we adhere to, that we love and cherish, um, that uh, uh, come from bygone times and, and are either still valuable or they do no harm. Okay? Um, but you always have to examine them, um, you know, because, for instance, um, Grandpa didn't need no indoor bathroom. You know, he had the outhouse, so I'm going to use the outhouse because if it's good enough for Grandpa, it's good enough for me. And then, you know, you live in the middle of the city and you build an outhouse in the backyard. Neighbors aren't going to like that. You know, it starts to smell after a while. So anyway, so uh, sometimes tradition isn't good just simply because it's traditional. Yeah. There's this uh, story about a, a young woman, call her Sally, okay. Um, um, Sally uh, was just married, and uh, she was baking a uh, ham, an Easter ham, say an Easter ham, for the first time. And uh, she didn't know how to do it. You know, she never paid attention when uh, Mama was doing it, okay. So she, uh, um, uh, so she was baking the ham and uh or wanted to bake the ham and so she called up you know, her mama and said mama how do you bake the ham you know i'm sorry i never paid much attention when you were doing it so you know so can you help me out and you know mama's of course you know always glad to <laughs> tell the kids what to do so anyway so so she says okay honey and you know so first thing you do is you cut off the ends of the ham and then you put it in the pan and you glaze it with brown sugar and honey if you want it. Give it a nice glaze and put it in the oven for, you know, cook it, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I don't cook. I just follow my wife's instructions. Okay, so anyway, but, but Mama knew. And so she told Sally how to cook the ham. And so Sally, you know, gets the ham out on the table and starts to look at it. And he goes, why do you cut off the ends? Couldn't figure that out. I mean, it didn't make sense. I mean, the other stuff made sense, but that didn't make sense. So she calls Mama back, right? Mama, I'm looking to uh, fix this ham, and I can't figure out why you cut off the ends. And Mama thought for a moment. She says, well, you know, honey, I, I, I don't know. I don't know right on myself. And what, what, why don't you call Grandma? Grandma knows, because I learned from her. She showed me how to do that. So, oh, okay. So, uh, so Sally calls Grandma. She says, Grandma, how do you cook a ham? Or, you know, Mama told me how to cook a ham, but, uh, but I can't figure something out. You know, Mama told me you have to cut off the ends, and I can't figure out why on earth you'd do that. And Grandma just starts laughing. She says, honey, <laughs> when your Mama was growing up, we were poor, and we could only afford one pot. We only had one uh, pan, one, you know, to bake the ham in. And it was too small for the ham. So that's why I cut off the ends. <laughs> okay. So you see, uh, the tradition was kind of locked in in an unthinking fashion, and people forgot why it happened in the first place. And so Sally never again cut off the ends of the ham because the tradition had lost its usefulness. And sometimes that's the case. So you always have to examine and not take for granted that just because somebody says this is traditional, that that's valid. And neither can you use the, the argument of something being traditional as just kind of, we've always done it this way. And that's, that's it. That's absolute truth because it might be like grandpa's outhouse or, you know, cutting the ends off the ham. And in a more serious vein, um, you know, yeah, 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 I don't even want to name uh, the traditions, but we can all think of traditions that are very disquieting, very ugly, that uh, have existed uh, from time to time in our country and in other countries around the world, that we would not accept as decent, good behavior, and certainly not just because they're 
traditional. Okay, so it's a possible fallacy. It could be a very good fallacy, and you know, I'm no, no very good practice. I'm sorry. Uh, could be not a fallacy or just a harmless practice. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Christmas trees, uh, taking the uh, kids to see Santa, uh, giving presents on Christmas, and you know, you know, all these other wonderful things that we do. You know, the you know, <laughs> the Easter Bunny egg rolls, and you know, all the other wonderful traditions. You know, the Fourth of July, and you know, you know, to recognize our our country's uh, birthday. All these things are wonderful traditions. Okay, and there are many other traditions. Uh, you know, the way that we govern ourselves. I mean, you know, largely traditional, right? Uh, you know, you know, voting and. Uh, um, uh, you, you know the tradition of the two-party system, and all these are are valuable. You know, and certainly anything can be questioned, but uh, um, but tradition isn't necessarily a fallacy by itself. But you do have to think about it. Okay, you you have to think about it. So chalk it up to a possible fallacy. So those are the fallacies of logic. Now, fallacies of emotion manipulate your emotions in order to persuade you or actually to trick you. Because remember, the fallacies are fake. They're not real. Um, now, there are valid calls to our emotions. Okay, you know we you know we love our families, we love our country, we love our neighborhoods, and you know our dogs, and you know I mean so you know. I'm, so these are valid uses and uh, resources for us in our lives, okay? But sometimes people will manipulate those emotions, and we have to watch out for those. So here are a few fallacies of emotion. The appeal to force. This is one of the most common. Um, we should recognize this from our schoolyard days, you know? Bully puts his fist in your face and says, give me your lunch money, you know, right? Well, whether you do or you don't, and that's another story, but the threat has nothing to do with the rightness of the appeal, you know, the persuasion, you know. And so it's not right what he's doing, even if somebody does give the bully um, his or her lunch money. Okay, so, um, uh, so the appeal to force or the threat, something bad's going to happen if you don't do what I say, um, that is an invalid argument. That doesn't mean that the argument is correct. It doesn't mean that the other person's position is correct. Even if you give in, okay, even if the threat is credible, you know, I'm going to burn down your house unless you, you know, um, uh, pay insurance, right? That's the, you know, that's the classic gangster uh, uh, threat, right? You need insurance. Um, no, I don't. I don't need insurance. Well, it'd be a pity if something happened to you, if uh, if your house burned down. You go, hmm. Okay, so I wonder if my house is going to burn down. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe I better pay this guy insurance. Okay, that's a threat. It has nothing to do with the validity of the argument. The appeal to pity is another. Um, uh, fallacy of emotion. You're urged to agree um, because of the pity that is aroused in you for the uh, person or the cause um, that uh, uh, that's being espoused. Okay, it has nothing to do with the rightness of the argument. Now, very often, I mean, you know, we we do feel pity. We do give to charity because we feel sorry for the people who suffer. Now, that's okay. Um, but you have to be careful because sometimes people play on your emotions. Um, I once had a car salesman uh, uh, try try that on me. And, uh, oh, please uh, buy the car today because I have to make my quota, and my boss says that. You know, well, you see, it had nothing to do with my need for the car or the value of the car that he wanted me to uh, buy. I was supposed to buy the car because I felt pity for the salesperson, and I didn't buy the car. Uh, you know, I'm a hard-hearted SOB that I am. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a good deal. Wasn't the 
after I looked at it, it wasn't the car that I wanted, uh, and um, and and I guess I resented, you know, the uh, the logical fallacy that uh, was being uh, played on me. Okay, so anyway, so <laughs> uh, never try that on a professor uh, of logic. Here's another um, example of appeal to pity. Why else would we buy stale, overpriced cookies from that cute little kid in front of the store who's uh, trying to raise money for summer camp, uh, except for pity? Now, I hate the cookies. I never eat the cookies. I throw them away. I already try to find somebody who does like them, but I'm a sucker. I, I always buy the cookies. I buy two boxes. Oh, sure, I'll, I'll buy two. G give me two boxes, okay? <laughs> That's an appeal to pity. Okay, um, there's nothing of value in the cookies themselves, and I know that. Um, but uh, but even I uh, am not so hard-hearted that I can resist a cute little kid <laughs> desire to go to summer camp. But that's an appeal to pity. It's a logical fallacy. Now the bandwagon fallacy is essentially everybody else is doing it, so you should too. You see this in the advertisements all the time. Biggest showroom west of the Mississippi, or east of the Mississippi, or something to do with the Mississippi, right? Uh, you know, uh, um, 50 million customers, happy customers, you should be one too. You know, this has nothing to do with the quality of the product, okay? This is, um, uh, vote for me because I'm electable, and I'm electable because everybody's going to vote for me, and everybody's going to vote for me because I'm electable, and, you know, so that has nothing to do with the argument, with the, with the, with with the real value in the product or the politician or anything else that everybody else is doing it. Now, the name bandwagon is kind of interesting. It um, comes from the days in uh, you know the 1800s in, uh, in America when uh, politicians would be running for some sort of office and they'd get a bandwagon, you know, a, a wagon, okay, and they'd uh, put a band on it, hence bandwagon, uh, probably a few kegs of beer, and they'd roll it through town. And uh, people would start jumping on it, probably because of the band and the beer, okay? But then other people would see that other people were jumping on it, so they'd jump on it too, and every, pretty soon everybody was on the bandwagon. Um, not because of anything of value that the politician had to say, but because everybody was on the bandwagon, so hence the bandwagon effect, okay? So, but that's a fallacy, that everybody else is doing it um, uh, does not say that the argument is right. Now regarding the bandwagon, your mother used to warn you about this. Okay, well if you remember, and you should remember, because what she said was true. Well if everybody else jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff too? Well, I hope not. Just because everybody else is jumping off a cliff doesn't mean it's a good idea. That's a bandwagon argument. That's a bandwagon effect. And it's not a good idea. So, as I said, the appeal to the mob appeals to the lowest, most animalistic instincts. Okay, this were the mob, the pitchfork carrying, torch carrying mob comes into play. Okay, if we don't act now, we'll be overrun. All our values are thrown in the gutter. Everything we hold dear will be destroyed. They're coming after you. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Watch out, be afraid, be very afraid. Oh, uh, but vote for me. Okay, so uh, it's a logical fallacy. It's a fake argument. The appeal to the mob appeals to the lowest, most animalistic instincts. Okay, this were the mob, the pitchfork carrying, torch carrying mob comes into play. Okay, if we don't act now, we'll be overrun. All our values are thrown in the gutter. Everything we hold dear will be destroyed. They're coming after you. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Watch out. Be afraid, be very afraid. Oh, uh, but vote for me. Okay, so uh, it's a logical fallacy. It's a fake argument. If you like this video, uh, please hit the like, thumbs up below, and uh, subscribe. Also, uh, for the complete course, uh, you can find this on Skillshare. Um, Skillshare is an online learning community uh, with thousands of classes in design, the arts, including writing, all kinds of writing, creative writing, technical writing, um, business tech, and a lot of other uh, disciplines. Um, uh, and you can learn cutting edge skills, uh, you can network with peers, you, know, you can discover new opportunities, explore new interests, develop your talents, 
anything you want to do. It, it's great. And if you click the link below uh, uh, for the Skillshare link, uh, you get two free months that you can just try it out, do whatever you want to, take all 24,000 classes if you want to in those two months and then quit. Don't pay a penny. Um, and did I mention it's free? <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, so join up, click subscribe, uh, give me a thumbs up, and um, hope to see you soon. Skillshare is for designers, photographers, marketers, artists, and lifelong learners. Skillshare is for foodies, commuters, risk takers, the young, and the young at heart. It's for strategists, free spirits, purists, the bold, the curious, the characters, the makers, and the breakers. Skillshare is for everyone, an online learning community with thousands of classes to advance your career, improve the world, and pursue the work you love. What will you learn next? It all starts on Skillshare.